Good morning. Hi, my name is Sandy Srinivas. I'm a medical oncologist here at Stanford. I'm the uh, lead medical oncology. I lead our clinical program here at Stanford in urologic oncology. And uh, I want to welcome all of you and thank you all for uh, choosing to spend your Saturday with us here today. I'd like to thank um, the Kidney Cancer Association for uh, allowing us to host this event here at Stanford. I've been here at Stanford for about uh, 19 years now, and um, this uh, Kidney Cancer Association has been hosting this event for much longer than that. They used to do it up in San Francisco with uh, Dr. Um, minor leading this at uh, CPMC and then many years ago Dr. Minor asked me to take over this and uh, we've been doing that up in the city and I think in the last three years because we have such a nice uh, place here at Stanford we decided to host it here at Stanford campus itself. Again this is a day just totally dedicated for you. We have put together a good group of people to um, help educate and tell you what's the best and what's upcoming in kidney cancer. So <clears throat> my job is to do a brief introduction just to set the stage right. But I have a good group of people here talking, so all I'm going to do is just do an introduction and then uh, allow the rest of the day to go on. So here I'm going to start off by uh, saying that the um, this is the picture of the kidney, and not every uh, cancer that starts in the kidney is kidney cancer. So the kidney is made up of the cortex. Let me see if I can make this pointer work. So this is the cortex, all this white part. And then this part is all called the renal pelvis. This is where urine is made, and urine then is transported to this tube called the ureter, and that's a different type of cancer. That's called renal pelvis or urinary type of cancer, which is not what we are going to be talking about today. All of the cancers that we are talking about are those that arise in the cortex. That's what kidney cancer is. And this is an estimate of what the uh, total number of kidney cancers per year are. This is um, the incidence of cancer in men and women and the estimated deaths that happen from cancer. Fortunately, kidney cancer is not very common. You know, it, is, um, it affects only about 40,000 people, but it does come under the top 10 cancers that affect people. There's good and bad to it when a cancer is not very common. We don't get enough resources. We don't get enough attention paid to a cancer like this. But it does feature in the top 10 in both men and women. And there are still, even today, significant deaths that happen from this disease. So clearly, it's a disease where we need to pay more attention and have our resources and energy in figuring out better treatment options. So here is what happens to patients. Uh, curability depends on the stage of cancer. So we think about kidney cancer as being localized when the disease is just contained in the kidney. There's a second group of patients where we think about it as being locally advanced, where it goes beyond the kidney to affect the major blood vessels or sometimes even the draining lymph nodes. And then finally, metastatic disease is when it escapes the kidney and gets to other organs such as lung, liver, bone. A large, I mean, 45% of patients present with early stage disease, and for them, removal is all that's needed, and they achieve a very high cure rate. Unfortunately, 30% of patients today present with metastatic disease as their first site, so it's not uncommon for patients to go to the emergency room for a cough or back pain, and they get a scan done, and there is spread outside of the kidney. The kidney is an organ, it's located in such a place that it can grow, 
and not have any symptoms at all. So people are lucky if they notice blood in their urine. Certainly we don't tend to ignore that. When you have blood in your urine, it brings you to medical attention and they can detect the disease. But not all patients present with blood in the urine. So again, 30% of patients present with disease that's quite advanced, even at the time of diagnosis. So here is a, a schema of what the staging system looks like. So stage one are small tumors that are less than seven centimeters. Those are considered to be stage one. Seven seems like a big size, but so long as it's contained within the kidney, that's stage one. And there is a cure rate with kidney removal of close to about 85 to 90 percent if you can remove it then. Stage two are tumors that are greater than seven centimeters but still contained in the kidney. And um, even for that group of patients, so long as we're able to remove it, there is still a very high cure rate. Stage three, again, is what we call as locally advanced disease. These are uh, tumors that have escaped the kidney, gone into the blood vessel, either the renal vein or the big blood vessel called the inferior vena cava or the surrounding fat. And then finally, stage four is if we have disease that's spread outside of the draining lymph nodes for the kidney. So if someone were to have a neck lymph node or obviously disease that gets to lung, um, bone, and other organs would be considered stage four. So kidney cancer we know is not one disease. This is the majority of patients have a histologic subtype called clear cell, and then we group everything else as non-clear cell. I'm not going to spend too much time on this because our subsequent speakers are going to dedicate a talk just on pathology, but I just wanted to set the stage to say that it's not one disease. There are many subtypes, and hopefully in the years to come, we'll have a drug for every one of these these subtypes. So here, here is a little bit of background on the treatment. So prior to, so 10 years ago, all we had for kidney cancer was uh, immunotherapy with a drug called interferon, which was very, very ineffective and tough for people to take. And then subsequently, there was another drug called interleukin-2 that came about. Unfortunately, interleukin-2 was not um, a drug, a treatment that could be delivered to every patient. You really required it to have uh, completely normal organ systems because it was a remarkably toxic treatment. So the treatment that we had 10 years ago was applicable to a very small number of patients. And then the last 10 years have just seen, um, I want, I'm going to show you, but I think we have close to 10 drugs today for patients with kidney cancer. And I think it's really the effort of all of the efforts that have been put into understanding the biology and behavior of this disease that's led to this. So to show that, here is my slide that shows the progress that we have made in kidney cancer. So 1992 was the first approved drug with high dose interleukin-2. And then there was really a lull. There was not much that happened between 1992 and 2005. And the first targeted drug was approved in 2005 with a drug called sorafenib. And then you can see almost every year there was a new drug that was FDA approved. In 2006, we had a drug called sunitinib. In 2007, there was a new class of drug called mTOR inhibitors with a drug called temsirolimus. 2008, there was a drug called bevacizumab. 2009, we had both uh, everolimus approved, which is an oral drug that's in the same class as temsirolimus. In 2010, there was a drug called pazopinib. 2012, axitinib. So it's just been a, a remarkable, it's, they, we call it the embarrassment of riches, where we really had a, a pretty large number of drugs that we could pick from. And I think the, um, the excitement uh, with a new class of drugs that became available was in 2015 with another immunotherapy drug called nivolumab. And I think this is really going to change the way we take care of patients with kidney cancer, that now we have come to a point where we are asking our own immune system to do what it takes to go fight the cancer. And then in 2016, again, we have two other drugs, cabozantinib and a combination of lenvatinib and everolimus. 
So here is my uh, summary slide for what is the current treatment in 2016. We have immunotherapy with the old drugs like interferon, interleukin-2, and nivolumab. And then you can see that this class of drugs called VEGF inhibitors have really, that list is long but it's only getting longer, and then we have mTOR inhibitors. So in some of the talks today, we are going to talk about how can we pick from this list what is best for a given individual? How do we juggle these drugs around so that all our patients can benefit from each of these drugs in a, in a logical way? So this is a little confusing slide, but these are the cells these are the players that are engaged in these various drugs, and these are the different drugs. So you're looking at, this is the tumor cell. This whole thing and beyond is the tumor cell. This is the lymphocyte, which are our immune-fighting cells. And then these are the blood cells called the endothelial cells. So what we know so far, at least in terms of the biology, and you'll hear more about it during the rest of the talks today, is that when you have an inactivated <clears throat> VHL, that causes some downstream effects that results in increase in an activation of certain genes, which are the VEGF genes, vascular endothelial growth factor genes. And all of our drugs that we have in that list of VEGF inhibitors work at this endothelial cell. Then working in the T cell are our immunotherapy drugs. And you'll hear about a few today, but there's definitely that list is getting long. And our hope for the future is that we'll be able to combine several of these things to give us the best outcome. So what are the important clinical questions that we have today? Um, we used what we think are clinically relevant and what our strengths here are at Stanford to be able to give you a day today that's going to be uh, educational for you. So to address is kidney cancer one disease, you're going to hear from our GU pathologist, Sunny, about that in the next talk. What improvements can be done in local therapy? Should the kidney be removed in patients with stage four disease? How best can we take care of localized kidney cancer without causing a lot of morbidity? We're gonna have Dr. Uh, ben Chung, who's one of our urologists, talk about that today. There's so much information out there from big data. You know, how can we use technology being in the Silicon Valley? How can we use information like that to leverage what we can do for our patients? One of our urologists, John Leppert, is going to talk about uh, how can we learn from existing information and learn to do things in a smarter way. I showed you that long list with various therapies. How do we pick therapy? And I'm going to have one of our uh, junior uh, fellows, Sumit Shah. He's going to talk about picking medical therapy. And then finally, with all of this list, one of the disappointing things in kidney cancer has been, how do we pick the best drug for a given patient? Is there a biomarker that can help us choose among these 10 drugs for a given individual? We're really delighted to have Alice Fan, one of our medical oncologists here at Stanford, address that today. And then I'm really excited about this last talk, which is the whole uh, field of oncology is moving towards precision medicine and individualized medis medicine. How can um, molecular information and genomics help us pick a therapy? So Alex Election, who's one of our uh, fellows, is going to address that today. And finally, we'll end up with my favorite part of the day, which is really engaging all of you in a patient forum with um, Jordan Chavez. So I think I'll stop with that. And here is the agenda. All of you have that in front of you. And with that, I'd like to welcome uh, Carrie Konoski from the Kidney Cancer Association to speak briefly.